Please start taking your seats. We are about to begin in just a moment. We're going to give a few seconds for everybody to join the audience here tonight. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. How are you feeling tonight? I don't hear you. Give me more energy. That's right. That's, right. That's the energy that we need. Celebratory moment. Welcome everybody to the 2021 edition of the Tickets Remarkable Venue Awards. My name is Luis Bracamontes and I will be your host for tonight. Hola a todos, sean bienvenidos a la edición 2021 de los Tickets Remarkable Venue Awards. Mi nombre es Luis Bracamontes y seré su anfitrión esta noche. All right, this is our fifth annual celebration but this time, for the first time, we're doing a hybrid event, both in person and also online, so that all museums and attractions that want to join us from everywhere in the world can be part of this celebration. To everyone watching at home, we are uh, presenting from the Tourism Innovation Summit in Sevilla. We're really excited and thrilled to have you all tonight. We hope you are just as excited as we are. For those who managed to get a drink, great. We've got to have a drink afterwards. For those watching at home, we hope you also have a celebratory drink ready to celebrate with us. Tonight is all about highlighting the best museums and attractions around the world. The past 18 months have been particularly challenging for everybody in the industry. But tonight, we are here to acknowledge and celebrate that we've made it here together and we are stronger and better than ever before. So let's take a moment to acknowledge all your hard work, dedication and resilience because 2022 is going to be one hell of a comeback. Am I right? So let's get into the agenda for tonight. First, We'll kick things off with a welcoming speech from Luke Elsinga, the co-founder and president of Tickets. Afterwards, we'll give the mic to our keynote speaker, Aziz Abusara, who is an author, an explorer, and a National Ge Geographic explorer. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, the reason why we're here, we're going to announce the winners for the 2021 Remarkable Venue Awards. We have seven categories and there are six regions competing for the title in their own category. We have Spain, the UK and Ireland, the US, Italy, France, and of course, the Netherlands. So without further ado, we have an action-packed hour. I'm gonna give the mic to Luke. Take it away, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and um, thank you from, um, from the United States, from Asia, from Australia. We have around 500 venues watching online. Uh, you all here, uh, thank you, TIS, for making this all possible. Edgar, I don't know if you have the time to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, seven years ago, in 2014, we started Tickets, and with a clear mission to make culture more accessible. Um, to make and to get away um, uh, boundaries to enjoy more frequently museums and attractions and the great experience they, uh, they create. And seven years later, we're here at this with a great team. Um, and I think about eight, nine people of them are here. And I want, first of all, a big applause on the organization of uh, the awards of all the team. So thank you. So th this award is special for us. Um, and why is it? Because it's super strange that the reason to travel doesn't get the acknowledgement of being the reason to travel, right? We're talking about hotels, we're talking about flights in the, in the industry, and museums, attractions, experiences is always number third. But if they weren't there, there was no flights, there were no hotels, they are the reason to travel. And this tonight, with our venue award is really a podium to celebrate what they are bringing, the innovations they're bringing, 
and that they bring a lot of joy for all of us when we're traveling or even when we're at home and celebrating these things um, when we're with our families and stuff. So, so tonight with these, with these awards, it's, it's a way of, of, for us giving these venues a podium to inspire us all how we can even improve these things. I think great innovations have been done and are being done right now. And I think, you, you know, from all over the world, um, we get inspiration how we can really improve these, um, these uh, experiences. So one thing back, we started this seven years ago. And seven years ago, with a mission of, of making culture more accessible um, and make a smile on everybody's faces when you walk into a museum and you go back, that you have, that you wondered, and you see stories. And you see one side of the story, but you also see another side of the story. And when I go now into museums with my kids, we have a conversation. Why is this? This is so ugly, Dad. This is so ugly. Why, why are we going there? And, for, and one example I want to point out is I visited the 9-11 Museum in, uh, in, in New York a few years ago. And I was expecting a kind of a US museum where it was all about that the Americans are great. And I was, I was touched, I cried, because the, the story they told was balanced. They told a story about, you know, the people who fight it around this, this, this uh, unbelievable uh, moment in, in history, but it really was telling two stories. And I think that is really amazing when we are, are enjoying museums and attractions, that we are getting stories which tell two sides of, 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 of a story. Um, so I'm super, super happy. I'm honored that Aziz is here because I think he is the living symbol who wants to create a culture, a travel society, which will tell two stories. Well, I will not tell too, uh, too much more because I will do the keynote speech and I'm not suitable for that. Um, but thank you all for being here. Keep on inspiring. Keep on going what you're doing with your great attractions, great museums, great experience around it. And I hope and I know it will be a great 2022. Aziz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. This is a good audience. You can tell already from the beginning, everyone is so excited and I can hear noises and clapping. And you always, when you're doing a talk, you're hoping that's the audience you get. So thank you uh, for doing that. I just was hoping some of you would sit here so I can see you. Any, any volunteers would walk down? Yay, thank you. Appreciate it. That is so sweet. Uh, yes, so now I can, because those are sitting up there, you can see me, but I barely can see your faces. And I want to make sure people are enjoying what I'm saying and they understanding what I'm saying. So I have to look here and I can know if you are. So I want to start with telling you what does, uh, what does being an explorer mean? And what does being a National Geographic Explorer, because everywhere I go, people like to ask me, like, what does that mean? You're a National Geographic Explorer. How do you become a National Geographic Explorer? What does it really entail? And I became a National Geographic Explorer without knowing how and why, because I just one day uh, received an email and it said, the title was, congratulations, you've been named as a National Geographic Explorer. I opened the email, I'm like, this is fishy. No one has talked to me. I don't know what they are talking about. And I started reading the email and says, as an explorer, we will give you some money, send us your bank details, and we'll forward you some cash. <laughs> right, that's exactly what I thought. I'm like, hmm, sending me, sending you your, uh, my bank details, I'm sure I'll get some money or my bank account will become empty. So I ignored the email, I deleted it. Another week passes and I get another email. And it goes, have you received our email about becoming an explorer? I'm like, these people think I'm rich. They want my money. <laughs> no, delete again. Another week passes and I get a phone call and they say, we've been emailing you. This is so-and-so from National Geographic. Do you want to be an explorer or not? Like, yeah, this is serious. <laughs> and they go, yeah, it is. And I said, obviously, yes, this is cool. And, and I called one of my 
best friends and they say, National Geographic just told me that I'm gonna be an explorer. And he said, why? <laughs> That's when I realized I need more friends first. But to, to be fair to him, we were working in education. And when people think of explorers, they actually think of what names come to your mind when you think of explorers. Yeah, uh, you can think of Dora the Explorer, or you can think of Indiana Jones, or you think, you don't think of people who work in education. And at that time I was working in education, just starting to do some work in travel. And so it was weird. So I was actually working at a university at the moment. And he said, oh, maybe they want you to explore the faculty lounge. There are some ancient sandwiches in the back of this faculty, the faculty fridge and you could find some things that are really old. And um, yeah, I found some other friends after. But I'm telling you this story because you don't really need an organization to tell you you are an explorer. We all have an explorer inside all of us. That's why we travel. We like going on a new adventure. We like learning something new. That is what exploration is all about. That's why we all have this curiosity, this, uh, this feeling to embark on a journey and finding what, you know, when you go travel, what, what is it that people don't know about? And I wanna go figure it out. What are the sites that I can see? What are the stories that I haven't heard? That's what exploration is. And that exists in each one of us. And that's why travel industry exists as a whole is because we have this urge, this curiosity to go to places, to meet people. And so I want us to think about that tonight, to think about how powerful that is, and to remember that nothing can stop that act of curiosity. Nothing can stop our, our feeling of wanting to, to get to know something that we don't know. And we know that for sure now because of the last couple of years. Even with the pandemic, we still wanted to travel. Even when we were not able to get out of our homes, we found ways to travel. I just came from Jerusalem uh, last night and Israel, the West Bank, just opened its borders to travelers. And there are a lot of restrictions still on getting there. And despite that, I went on one of the first trips opening and the entry restrictions are serious and hard and there's so many tests and you have to get so many proofs and it's not simple. And despite that, so many people were lining up wanting to come. They wanting to travel. They wanted to see something. They wanted to get out. And to me, that gives me hope that just as you mentioned earlier, this coming year, it's going to be an amazing year and people are going to get out and people are going to travel more and more. In the last couple of years, to go back to the point that travel really never stopped even in the pandemic. It didn't stop when people couldn't get out of their homes. We started travel virtually. Tour guides started doing tours virtually. Uh, you know, we all had to become experts on how to use these virtual stuff, Zoom and so on, and trying to figure out how things work. Uh, museums started offering virtual tours. And it was incredible because I went on so many tours that I would never have done because it became available virtually. And it's not a replacement of traveling in person, but it's an encouragement. It's something that we're still learning. It makes me want to go to these places now that I saw virtually. It also encouraged travel locally. When we couldn't fly to other places, we started going to places close to us, national parks that are close to us, uh, hikes that we didn't know about that existed in our neighborhoods, museums that are local for us, that open and we always, you know, fly thousands of miles away, but never cross to that museum that are, is just next door to where we are. So these are all good things. And I think we learned so much from this last year, but none of that means we are not going to travel the way we used to anymore. And that's where I want to take us now. Um, travel is not about distance. Travel is a state of mind. This is one of my favorite thoughts because in the last year, this has become more and more real to all of us. It's like, even when I can't go far away, 
I still want to travel. I still want to learn. I still want to explore something new. So my title of the talk is focused about tolerance. It's about reimagining travel, the importance of travel as an act of diplomacy. You know, we think of travel as cultural. We think of travel as having fun. But we don't always think of travel as an act of diplomacy, as an act of peacemaking. And that's what I want to touch on. My background is in conflict resolution. I've worked in many conflicts around the world, from Syria to Afghanistan, to Colombia, to Chile, to pretty much everywhere you can imagine. And what I found is that meeting the other, connecting with those who don't you, you don't know, changes the world. And no industry has the power to do that like travel. We might not have thought about it, but we are actually all diplomats. We just need that red passport, that diplomatic passport. <laughs> Before he died, Stephen Hawking said in one of his last interviews, he said, the human failing I would most like to correct is aggression. And when I worked in conflicts, all these conflicts I, I mentioned, I kept thinking, how do I take my knowledge in conflict resolution and make it apply to a larger crowd, reach as many people as possible. And that's when I realized travel is the way. We, were, we live today in a world very divided, divided by wars, divided by walls. And even though we are connected by the internet, we still now live in echo chambers. And travel gets us out of our comfort zone, gets us to see things we might not be always comfortable to see when we are at our home. But when we travel, we're willing to do that. This is me when I was a little kid. and. Uh, when I was good looking back in the days. Also when my mom approved of my haircut because she doesn't like this thing. Um, and I grew up in Jerusalem. I grew up in conflict. I grew up seeing the other as the enemy. Many of us do. And for 18 years, I personally didn't even know my neighbors. I don't want to go through why in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can talk about that later. But I'll tell you, my first real trip was when I was 18 years old. And I told you earlier, travel is not about distance. This trip was about less than one kilometer, a few hundred meters away from my home, where it was my first time to meet my Israeli neighbors. And it was the most powerful trip I've ever taken because I got to learn what I didn't know. And it was simple things. Um, let me let me see. Uh, we, we, we started talking, I was taking a Hebrew class, and it was my first time meeting Israeli Jews in, in my class, being a Palestinian. It was their first time meeting a Palestinian. And we all were like, who is the other? Kind of like this tension, like, can I know you? Are we cool? Are we friends? And we started talking about things. We didn't speak the language yet, so we, we barely know enough words. And so we'll talk about music, we'll talk about coffee, still argued about both of these because it's Middle Eastern culture. You have to argue about something at some point. Um, but with the music, I like something called Western country music. Anybody knows Western country music? Any fans of us? Yeah, most people don't. Most Middle Easterners don't. I'm the only Palestinian who does, I think. The only maybe Middle Easterner who does. But in that classroom, I met Israeli Jews who did. Not many, like one. But that actually made us friends. We realized our identity isn't only based on what divides us, but also on what we agree on. And it was simple things, music. We started talking about coffee, and for some reason, Israelis love this coffee called Nescafe, instant coffee. It's horrible. Worst coffee. I'm going to get sued by Nescafe one day for, for saying this. And I like Arabic coffee. And again, it's simple things. Well, talk about it and I'm like you should try the coffee we drank and they're like okay fine and and we do that but also I remember walking one day to class and in the middle of the road I hear a siren and I don't understand what's happening everyone literally stands still this is my city I should know what's going on I have no idea what's going on everyone stands still no one willing to talk and my brain, I like sci-fi books, so my brain went, I went and started talking to people, asking them, why are you all standing still? Why nobody's moving? No one would talk to me. And my brain went into 
this is like one of those sci-fi movies or books I've read. There's an alien attack. They are controlling Earth. They have brainwashed everyone here except me. Therefore, I have to save the world. Okay, I was 18 years old. You know, those, the kind of thoughts you have as 18 years old. It's all to me to save the world. I run to my class and I meet my Hebrew teacher who was an Israeli Jewish woman and, and she could move and talk and the siren had just stopped. I'm like, this is gonna be amazing. You and I gonna have to save the world. It's like, not like these movies, two white guys save the world. It'll be an Arab man and a Jewish woman. It'll be like changing the way things work. But then she explained to me what happened. She said, oh, it's a Memorial Day for the Holocaust. I lived in Jerusalem all my life and I didn't know that. And I started thinking, these people saw me running, not knowing what's happening, freaking out, thought I was being disrespectful. And without me crossing the border, those 200 meters, few hundred meters, I would never have known about what's happening there. And by knowing, now I understand. That's how powerful travel is. It makes you realize things you didn't. It makes you understand things you didn't. And it makes you learn on things you didn't even know existed. Growing up as a Palestinian, I didn't know any of that. Martin Luther King Jr. says, men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate because they are separated. And again, what other industry you know that brings down separation, lack of communication, not knowing the other, like the travel industry, solving all these things that make us hate each other. This is my dad, he's 85 years old. And my dad went through similar experience to the one I just told you. I was running an organization that brings Israelis and Palestinians together and invited him to one of those meetings. I have to say my brother was killed in the conflict, so he's not, wasn't so excited about coming to those kind of meetings. He comes, he sits, we have Israelis and Palestinians that talk. And at the end of the talk, he decides to raise his hand and I'm thinking, I just made a big mistake. You never invite your parent to an event you in charge of because they are likely to embarrass you. And I didn't know how bad it's gonna go. It went worse than I expected because he raised his hand and he said, I got only one question, this Holocaust thing. See, it's pretty silent now when I mentioned that because that's how it felt then. Nobody ever starts a sentence with this Holocaust thing and is planning to say something constructive. And that was accurate because my dad stands up and says this Holocaust thing and then everyone's like, oh no. And I'm thinking, I wish earth could open up and swallow me. Did it really happen? I'm running away at this point because I'm like, I don't know this man. He just showed up on his own. Um, and everyone is silent. And then a friend who I knew in the organization stood up and said, my father was a Holocaust survivor. How about he takes you to the Holocaust Museum and shows you around and tells you his story. My dad agreed, but not only did he agree, 70 other Palestinians agreed to go. It was the largest delegation at that point of Palestinians to go to the Holocaust Museum. And it was so powerful because somebody said, I want to learn. Yeah, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I'm gonna ask the hard question. Again, that's the power of travel, you get to do that. My dad just came to the States recently to, to visit me. And the same thing happened. I, I took him mini golf. If you've ever been in mini golf, he thinks it's the best sport on earth. He doesn't know it's not really a sport, but he thinks he could be the champion of it. And, but one of the things he wanted to go pray and I sent him with a friend to a mosque. And instead of a mosque, he ended up in a synagogue because the mosque was renting the synagogue for prayer. And he loved it. It was his first ever time entering a synagogue. He's from Jerusalem. You know how many synagogues exist in Jerusalem? So many, and yet he's never been to one. And suddenly he goes to the United States and he enters a synagogue and he starts calling all my family saying, this is amazing, you won't believe it. I was in a synagogue for prayer. And they go, did you convert to Judaism? And he's like, no, no, Muslims and Jews get along here. We have something to learn. That's what travel does travel is an opportunity for us to correct our misconceptions about the destinations we visit this is in colombia 
This guy was a gang leader. He's killed people, had seven people in his family killed. His name is Mr. Pumpkin. That's how he likes to call himself. And Mr. Pumpkin is this incredible tour guide. He decided his town, instead of robbing tourists, which is what they were famous for, he will make their income through tourism. Again, we don't think always of tourism as an act of diplomacy, as an act of peacemaking, but the whole community was completely transformed because we decided to travel. Travel is a cultural exploration. It's a search for our missing stories. When we go to places, to museums, places like the Louvre or like the Marseille or, or British Museum or any of these, a legacy museum in Montgomery that I just recently visited, you get to learn about diversity, you get to learn about cultures, you get to learn about how we can connect as a humans together, things we didn't know we've done to each other, civilizations and the diversity that happened in those civilizations. That's what travel does. You also get to learn about things you wouldn't have cared about. This is from a trip, this is the best photo I ever taken, so I have to show it in every presentation I take. <laughs> It's a, it's a red-shanked monkey, it's in, uh, in Vietnam, and I went there, I found out about these monkeys from someone I knew there, locals, and they said, you have to go and see this monkey, it's an endangered animal. And I went with an organization called Green Viet, and they showed me, say, there's only about eight to 10,000 left maximum of this species, and suddenly I went from know nothing about conservation to becoming the biggest advocate for this, for protecting this monkey. But not only that, through travel, this is the best way to protect these monkeys. Because suddenly, instead of doing development where these monkeys live, the governments are realizing that, oh, we can use this monkey for tourism. Instead of building new apartments in the only place they can survive, we can actually bring tourists, and that's more important and that's how this monkey might survive being extinct and i'll finish with travel makes you speechless but then it turns you into a storyteller this is a quote from ibn battuta an arab traveler from seven eight hundred years ago and i love this quote because that's what travel does you meet people you connect with things you connect with stories and you don't know what to say and then you can go home and start telling stories. And in a minute, I'll just give you a couple examples. This is from Machu Picchu. I spent hours convincing this llama to pose for this photo. <laughs> and eventually, I succeeded. And I love this stuff. I love attractions. I like places. But the connections we, we create is what stays with us. And so my favorite experience there, going on this tour and getting to this village, and this little girl decides to become my tour guide. And she takes me to her home, and I drink tea with the family, and my Spanish is terrible, and yet it didn't matter, because we could connect beyond language. Travel isn't just about being able to speak to each other. It's about this connection of feeling I belong, I'm learning something, I connect to the people who are here. This is in Vietnam, again, spent tons of time trying to take this photo. I went on this tour in a farm, and I met this woman, 90 years old woman, who was still farming her home, smiling the whole time, giving me all these hugs, and feeling like this is, this is a connection that happens only when you travel. So when I look at next year, and I look at travel coming back, I'm very optimist, because I think this is what we're going to get. This is, this is how we can save our world, it's through travel, through connecting with one another, through realizing that different cultures are not a threat to, our, to us. It's exactly the opposite. We can innovate so much. The partnerships that happen, the ingenuity that happens because of travel, we don't even know how much the world is different today because of travel. And that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Asi. Such an inspirational keynote talk. We can all be 
diplomats and ambassadors of our own cultures to tourism. So it's a great reminder of the power of our industry. And I'm sure we're gonna continue with this mission in the years to come. Thank you so much. So now we've come to the actual main event of the session. Are you ready to hear the winners for the 2021 Remarkable Venue Awards? Yes, that's the spirit. <laughs> All right, so as most of you know, we have seven categories tonight. The first five categories are best museum, best attraction, best landmark, best on-site experience, and most remarkable venue. These five categories are based and selected on more than 850,000 reviews on tickets.com. So customers are driving the nominees and the winners for these categories. All of these uh, review-based awards had an impressive star rating and an excellent customer experience that proved to be a crowd favorite in the past year. And even with some audience and crowd limitations due to COVID, they managed to bring in the numbers and amazing experiences. The winners thus have been decided according to the best customer rating. For the remaining two categories, the most innovative venue and the best hidden gem, both of these are application-based awards. For these, we had a panel of experts from tourism and other industries related to culture and travel. And we asked them to select winning venues from over 80 applications from these six focus markets. Some of the experts are actually even here in the audience or are watching from home. So a big special shout out to all of you for being part of this process. Thank you so much. Each of these applications were assessed by this objective panel of experts from DMOs and organizations such as Museum Next, National Geographic, among other organizations. And of course, our global judge Douglas Quimby, the CEO of Arrival. <laughs> As part of the, on behalf of the tickets team, we would like to thank all of you for being part of this key process in this award show. It's been a total pleasure working with all of you. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to the tickets regional teams who will each be announcing the winners for the categories tonight. First up, we're going to be finding out the winners for the best museums in 2021. I'll hand over the mic to my colleague Beth, who is joining from the US right now. Please take it away, Beth. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth, and I'm the regional manager for the USA, coming to you from Wyckoff, New Jersey. It's a pleasure this evening to introduce to you the nominees for Best Museum. The Best Museum Award recognizes the best museums and art galleries featured on tickets.com. Any type of museum or art gallery is included in this category, regardless of size or fame, as long as they've garnered outstanding visitor reviews. Let's enjoy a short video to introduce this year's nominees for Best Museum.
so wonderful to see such a fantastic collection of museums from all over the world. Now it's time to announce the winners from each region. I'm pleased to announce that this year's winners are as follows. France, Musée Marmontant Monet. Italy, Museo Ferrari Marinello. Netherlands, Strat Museum. Spain, Cholita Le Coup. UK and Ireland, Old Royal Naval College. USA, National Museum of African American Music. Congratulations to all the winners in the Best Museum category. We've prepared a short video of the winning venues to highlight their achievements. After this video, my colleague Kim in France will take over to share the next award. Thanks so much. Bye. Hi everyone, my name is Kim and I'm the regional manager for France, coming to you from Paris. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce this year's nominees for the best attraction. Bonsoir à tous, je suis Kim, la regional manager pour la France et j'ai le plaisir cette année de vous présenter les nominés pour la catégorie meilleure attraction. This award honors the best attractions from theme park and zoo and aquariums to gardens and parks, stadium and arenas and entertainment. It recognizes venues that stand out for their appeal to all types of visitors. And this selection for this award is based on customers' reviews on tickets.com. So now let's enjoy a short video to introduce this year's nominees for the best attraction.
Now it's time to announce the winners in each region. So let me open this envelope. I'm pleased to announce this year's winners are as follow. For France, La Cité de la Mer. In Italy, Catacombs of San Gennaro. In the Netherlands, Maduro Dam. In Spain, Benal Madena Butterfly Park. For the UK and Ireland, the Scotch Whiskey Experience. And last but not least, in the USA, Thriller Miami. So congratulations to all the winners in the best attraction category. We've prepared a short video uh, for the winning venue to highlight their achievement. And then my colleague uh, Linda, based in the Netherlands, will take over to share the next award. À bientôt et bonne soirée à tous. Hi everyone, my name is Linda and I'm the Regional Manager for the Netherlands coming to you from Amsterdam. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you the nominees for the best landmark. Hi allemaal, ik ben Linda, de Regional Manager van Nederland en hier vanuit ons kantoor in Amsterdam natuurlijk een warm welkom voor al onze Nederlandse venues. This award category includes venues such as places of worship, like cathedrals or churches, castles, palaces, observation desks, and of course, iconic landmarks. Let's enjoy a short video to introduce this year's nominees for best landmark.
Now it's time to announce the winners in each region. I'm pleased to announce that this year's winners are as follows. For France, Chateau de Filandrie. For Italy, Milan Cathedral de Giomo. For the Netherlands, het Nationale Park de Hoge Veluwe. For Spain, it's Casa Baggio. For UK and Ireland, the Tower of London. And for the USA, the Empire State Building Observatory. Congratulations to all of the winners in the best landmark category. We've prepared a short video of the winning venues to highlight the achievements. After the video, my colleague Nadia in Italy will take over to share the next award. Fijne avond and tot snel. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia and I'm the Regional Manager for Italy, coming to you from Rome, the city of La Dolce Vita. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce the nominee of the best on-site experience. Ciao a tutti, sono Nadia, Regional Manager Italia. This category recognized the vendor top for the best on-site experience based on customer's review on ticket.com. The selection is based on customers' experience at the venue, including staff interaction and information available on site. The award celebrates the venue and their remarkable team. So let's enjoy a short video to introduce this year's nominees for best on site experience.
Now it's time to announce the winner in each region. So I'm thrilled to announce the 2021 winner for the best on-site experience. Starting with France, the winner is View Park de Duy La Fontaine. Then in Italy, the winner is Parco Cavour. For Netherlands, congratulations to Marites. In Spain, the winner is the Vax Museum Barcelona. For UK and Ireland, congratulations to Windsor Castle. And then in US, the winner is Museum of the Bible. Congratulations again to all the winner in the Western Side Experience category. We have prepared a short video of the winning venues to highlight their achievement. After that, Alexis in the UK, my colleague, will take it over to share the next award. Good evening, Seville, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you watching virtually. My name is Alex. I'm the regional manager for the UK and Ireland, coming to you tonight from London. It's my pleasure this evening to announce the nominees and the winners of our application-based awards, for which we received over 80 applications. I'll start with the most innovative venue award. The most innovative venue award recognizes museums and attractions that have found unique and original ways to appeal to customers. This could include sustainability initiatives, creative marketing strategies, or new technology. As we come out of the pandemic, now is the time to innovate. Competition for this award was tight, with excellent examples of innovation coming from venues across all our participating markets. Let's enjoy a short video to introduce this year's nominees for Most Innovative Venue.
now it's time to announce the winners in each region. I'm pleased to announce this year's winners are as follows. For France, Paris Montparnasse, top of the city. Italy, Mostra de Leonardo. The Netherlands, Remastered. Spain, Puy de Foy, España. Apologies for the pronunciation. For the UK and Ireland, RHS Garden Wisley. And for the USA, the Las Vegas Raiders. Congratulations to all the winners in the most innovative venue category. We've prepared a short video of the winning venues to highlight their achievements. After this, you'll be passed over to my colleague Gina. Live from New York, it's at, no wait, that's the wrong one. Gina, live from New York to present the next award. Thank you and good night. Hi everyone, my name is Gina Fitzpatrick and I'm the Regional Manager for the USA coming to you live from New York City. It's my pleasure this evening to announce the winners of our second applications-based award, the Best Hidden Gem Award. I'd like to give a quick shout out to all my partners in New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, and all the amazing cities in the USA. This award is focused on recognizing a venue which is off the beaten track, unique or unconventional, and highlights lesser known and more niche museums and attractions to travelers the world over. Let's have a look at this year's nominees for Best Hidden Gem. Now it's time to announce the winners in each region. I'm pleased to announce this year's winners are as follows. France, how to become a Parisian in one hour. Italy, 
the Garden of Calumbethra, Netherlands, Strat Museum, Spain, Velasquez Tech Museum, UK and Ireland, Roald Dahl Museum, USA, Musical Instrument Museum. Congratulations to all of the winners in the Best Hidden Gem category. Before we take a moment to see these winners in video, on behalf of Tickets, I'd like to thank all of the applicants who applied for one of these awards and the judges who carefully reviewed each application to make sure the award went to the most deserving candidate. Now let's discover why these hidden gems took home the award in their video. After this, my colleague Jaume in Spain will present the last award for the evening, the award we've all been waiting for, the most remarkable venue. Hi everyone, it's always a bad idea to present after wonderful Gina. <laughs> Next year I'm going to ask to be first. So I'm, I'm the regional manager of Spain, for those of you who don't uh, know me. And it's going to be my pleasure this evening to introduce the last of the awards today, which is the most remarkable venue. Eh, hola, gracias por venir. Eh, ya casi hemos acabado, que estáis ya un poco todos en plan de la naranja mecánica. Eh, vamos a dar el, el último premio, que siempre tengo problemas para traducir esto de Morro y Marca Volvenio. Yo normalmente digo que es el venio, que es la leche. Uh, <laughs> the Most Remarkable Venio Award is presented to venues that are true fan favorites. All type of venues qualify for this award with nomination based on the size of the audience uh, a venue draws and their ability to thrill customers with the experience they offer. Uh, the winners for this award are based on the most popular and best, review, uh, best reviews on tickets.com. So I'm thrilled to introduce this year's nominees for most remarkable venue, well, que es la leche.
I see the people in the, U in the UK are real supporters, huh? <laughs> Did you guys get an award? <laughs> at, at least you made it to Seville, right? <laughs> okay, you ready? Let's go. So for the last time this evening, I'm going to announce the, the winners of this uh, last category. Here are the most remarkable venues in the world. Uh, for France, it's the Musée de l'Orangerie. For Italy, it's the Vatican Museums. For the Netherlands, it's the Van Gogh Museum. For Spain, I'm going to leave this one for the last. <laughs> for the UK and Ireland, it's the Royal Liver Building 360. For the USA, the Manuel Collection. And uh, last but not least, for Spain, it's the Dali Theatre Museum. Again, thanks to, to everyone for coming. Uh, thank you for, for being here. And I'm going to leave the stage to Luis again to, to wrap up. And, uh, but the competition is not over. Luis is going to tell us more. A heartfelt congratulations to all the winners, but also to all the museums and attractions that were nominated. You are all truly doing an incredible job. And as we heard from Aziz, this is an industry that is bringing the world together. To all the winners that couldn't be here with us, we'll be in touch with all of you in the coming days to deliver your award. But wait, the remarkable venue awards are not over yet. That's right, there's more. In the, com in the coming weeks, we're going to open the voting to look for the best of the best in each of the categories. This voting will be open to all the museum and attraction goers around the globe to decide who is the crown jewel for each category. That's right, you heard it correctly. All the winners for the seven categories are going to compete for the global title. The competition is gonna open in December and museum and attraction goers are gonna have until mid-January to vote. So this is also an invitation to invite your fans, your audience, your family and friends to vote so you can win the global title for 2021. How does that sound? <laughs> we'll be sharing more information about it in the, uh, in the coming weeks for, uh, for the best of the best competition. So there you have it. We've seen amazing museums and attractions throughout these markets. And I'm sure many of you are going to be inspired for the coming days and the rest of the year. We have something to look forward for 2022 and us as tickets, we wish you that you enjoy truly the rest of 2021. Thank you so much for joining us in this celebration. We hope you continue enjoying the Tourism Innovation Summit. Thank you so much. Buenas noches a todos.